book talks about mechanical energy, so we'll, we'll cover this, right? So mechanical energy, we're going to describe it into two terms, the kinetic part and the potential part. And the potential part is what you did in freshman physics, right? Force on a slope, you move it up, you can calculate change of potential energy. Now, let's consider a flowing fluid. So I have some fluid flowing in a pipe. And so I have some pipe that which kind of looks like a funky funnel, and I have fluid flowing in. And I just want to do thermodynamics, do a thermodynamics problem on this, right, funnel or pipe. So I have to draw my pipe. I have an input. I draw my boundary. Out here is my surroundings. I have my fluid coming in. I have my fluid coming out. In this case, I haven't made a distinction of whether there's heat loss across the boundary, whether I'm doing work and changing the boundary conditions, making, you know, like if I had some type of pipe where I could pull it and make it longer and thinner, right? I'd be doing work on it, then that would change the flow properties. But anyways, I have flowing fluid through a pipe. The inlet and outlet are at different locations. So if you notice, I put H1 here relative to the center of my pipe and H2 here relative. So this could be sea level, right? It's some point of reference for H. So the difference between H1 and H2 doesn't make any difference as long as I choose a reference, it's going to be the same, right? My reference has to be constant, though. So typically we use sea level, right? So let's do a full energy expression for a flowing fluid. Now remember, there's mechanical energy, which is kinetic plus potential. So I'm going to be writing out the mechanical energy associated with a flowing fluid. So I have one part, which is this kinetic part, 1 half mv squared. Plus, I have potential part, MGH. Plus I have another type of potential part which I call pressure volume. Pressure times the volume. So if this is really high pressure, and I do some elemental volume here, I could have a different pressure over here. So let's just say that our elemental volume is the same here versus over there. Let's draw a pancake. Actually, I have it kind of below. So I have some elemental volume. I can do the same here. So there's a volume associated with this, so there's some small delta x. I could have the same elemental volume at the end. And we just call that V. So as I increase the pressure within my elemental volume, what happens to its mechanical energy? It increases, right? So there's this potential part related to height above sea level. There's also this internal pressure part of the internal energy or potential energy of the fluid. Then there's the kinetic part, how just basically in simply in simple terms, how fast it's flowing. 
So the mechanical energy associated with a flowing fluid has a kinetic, a potential, and another potential related to, you know, it's how, how much it's pressurized. Now I can write this a little bit differently. I could do it on a per unit mass basis. So I have one half V squared plus GH plus already talked about the specific volume. Rho equals 1 over the specific volume. So I just took the volume here, divided by mass. That's equivalent to multiplying the mass out here. And I'm getting that. So this is another form of writing out the mechanical energy associated with fluid flow. And so I could write it as E M sense and I could use a small e. So the book does this. We won't use this subscript very much, but in some other contexts you can use it a lot, and it simplifies things. So kinetic. Potential. The book likes to say flow energy. So in an earlier example, we talked about the idea of flow of the rate of heat transfer. And so we had the total heat, which was Q. And then we had the rate of heat transfer, which was Q dot. So we can do the same type of thing. So we have the total energy associated with fluid flow. We can have the rate of mechanical energy of fluid flow. So if I take my hose, I turn on the faucet, right? Before, or I t you know, whatever, garden hose. Before I turn on the faucet, what is the mechanical energy of fluid flow? Basically nothing, right? It might have some potential somewhere else, but of fluid flow, there's no flow. Then I turn it on, I might have my hose going all the way up to a water tower, right? So I could look at that mechanical. But say if I turn it on really, really slow, then as I'm opening it more and more the valve, my mechanical energy of fluid flow is increasing. And it's going to be mainly due to this part and that part. So this is rate form. And then back to my elemental volume, I have some delta x. So related to this, d, dt, Q equals Q dot, D, D, T, E, fluid flow equals E dot, fluid flow. And if I want to do this in kind of even a simpler notation, I could say delta Q over delta T, delta E. Right. If I integrate this, put an integral sign here, dt, I end up with q. If I integrate this, put my dt here, I end up with q. So 
time rate of change mechanical Is there a thermal part to this? Is there a thermal interaction part to this mechanical? So this expression, time rate of change, or this one, just the internal mechanical. So you can, so if I look at it, it's a kinetic part. So there is this velocity, right? The velocity which it's flowing, but this velocity is at a macroscopic scale. What I'm getting to is this is the mechanical part. If I want to if I want to look at the total energy associated with a flowing fluid, I would have its mechanical part plus a thermal part. And that thermal part would tell you the temperature of the would would be based off the temperature of the fluid. So hot water flowing is going to have at one velocity and a given pressure through it a pipe of a certain diameter is going to have one, a certain amount of energy. If I have really, really hot water flowing at the, all those same parameters, it's going to have more energy. But this doesn't account for the temperature of the fluid. This only accounts for the mechanical part. So I might have fluid flowing in with a uniform distribution. I have friction at the wall, so I end up getting a velocity distribution inside. Just introducing that idea. We'll be talking about that a little bit more. I also introduced this idea of elemental volume. Right? Calculus, we break things down into a differential dx. We break it up into a bunch of little squares, right? So in fluids and thermodynamics and things like this, we break down our system into a bunch of pieces. So we broke out our inlet to our pipe into an elemental volume. We could do the same thing at each space along. So I have flowing mass. So that's what it looks like there. If I were to draw another one here, given it's an elemental volume, I could put a subscript delta x1. delta x2. My elemental volume is the same, is what I'm getting to. I defined an elemental volume that's the smallest volume increment which I'm defining. So because my radius decreased, so pi r squared decreased, right? My delta x has to be the same to maintain the same elemental volume. So when we have a flowing mass, there's going to be amount of mass within a given elemental volume. Okay? So if I say my control volume is one centimeter cubed, which is pretty big probably for an elemental, but I could say that one centimeter cubed, there's a certain amount of mass within it. Right, if it's water, right, then I know I got one one milligram of water. Or actually one gram. One gram. Density of water is a gram per centimeter cube. So I have if this represents one centimeter cubed volume, that represents one centimeter cubed volume. I have the same amount if it's constant density. 
right? I'm not changing incompressible system, let's say. Then there's one gram in here and there's one gram in there. So I want to talk about flowing mass in a control volume or elemental volume. And I just can write out the same. So this is energy and mass associated with fluid flow. So I have one half m v squared plus mgh plus mpv. Now, this says mass, right? It's not mechanical, it's mass. So I have another term. Now I have a small u, the internal energy per unit volume. So as my temperature of my flowing mass increases, my internal energy per unit mass increases. Simple way to write it is u equals That's a, this is a small C, or I can make a big C. But anyways, you get the idea. Internal energy increases with temperature. So this is the energy associated with a flowing mass, which includes its mechanical part and its right thermal part. And I can do the same thing. I can put it in rate form. So I got E mass at F dot equals d dt d mass which equals one half I have a d dt m v squared plus m g h plus m v plus m u so I have to take the derivative of all that Let's simplify it, and let's write E dot mass flowing fluid equals M dot. So all I said here is that the velocity isn't changing in time. It's a plus sign. Gravity isn't changing in time. The height inlet and outlet or whatever, the, in, the height of my tube and its orientation isn't changing in time. The pressure distribution within my pipe isn't changing in time. Its density is constant, right? Or its specific volume isn't changing in time. And the temperature of my fluid flowing isn't changing in time. The only thing is I have mass flowing in at a given rate. That's my mass flow rate. This is the form we will use a lot to solve problems. We will assume that things are relatively constant. We're not worrying about as we slowly turn on the pipe, right, on the faucet for the fluid flowing through. We're just gonna say that the velocity coming in and leaving is not changing in time. We're not changing the height of our tubes in time. Right? We're not going from Mars to Earth, changing gravity, right? So we'll pick up here.